Thank you very much, Shadhu Bob. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, I mean, I'm delighted to be speaking to Nokia Bell Labs for two reasons. I think the Bell Labs heritage is, you know, quite amazing. I was reading John Gertner's book about the, you know, the invention factory. Um, so to see that legacy continue is wonderful. And I've worked closely with Nokia in the past. Um, in a previous life before I was a professor, I worked with Nokia's um, in-house sustainability team uh, um, and on some um, human rights issues uh, on the telecommunications side of the business. So uh, it's great to be uh, in front of you. So today I'm going to be talking about human rights centered approaches to AI. So to situate this, I'm a lawyer by training and I work on technology and human rights issues. One of the things that's been really striking <clears throat> to me, I think a lot of people in the legal and policy field is just how much AI technologies have um, entered into the mainstream, right? So we're seeing more and more um, autonomous vehicles, for example, um, intelligent assistants, Siri, Alexa, et cetera. Um, we now have entire research institutions at, um, you know, that are devoted to studying AI and not from technological perspective, but in terms of social impact. So there's the AI Now Institute at New York University, for example. And I would say in the sort of human rights community, there's a lot of fear um, of AI. Um, there's fear around, for example, worker displacement. Um, bias is obviously a huge issue, bias and discrimination. And at the far end of the spectrum, um, you know, concern around things like lethal autonomous weapons. Um, I'm not really going to go that far in my talk, but you know, there's quite a, a few num a good number of reasons to be concerned about the impacts of this set of powerful technologies. So generally, you know, when we have conversations about the impacts of AI, whether it's among people like me or it's within technical com communities or when we do get together, um, most of those conversations have been happening um, and framed in terms of ethics or some other related concepts. So here's a slide that I took from the AMUK at the University of Helsinki, just down the road uh, from your headquarters, about the ethics of AI, right? This is a very common framing that we see. Um, United Nations put out this report on the ethics and, gover ethics and governance of artificial intelligence and health. And you could probably find hundreds and hundreds of similar reports that talk about ethics. And of course, we have some related concepts around fairness, accountability, and transparency. The ACM uh, FACT con conference is the premier conference to talk about those kinds of issues. And here too, if you look at this uh, page in detail, right, we're talking about uh, approaches that are grounded in ethics or other kinds of ethical concepts. So that's great. I'm 100% in favor of this. But um, my pitch to all of you today is that we should also be thinking about the impacts of AI in terms of human rights. So not just in terms of ethics or concepts like fairness, accountability, transparency, but human rights. Okay, so what am I gonna do in this talk today? Four basic things. First, a quick introduction to what human rights are. Second, um, some, uh, an example of how we could sort of determine what the human rights impacts are of a particular AI application. Third, um, that's the argument section, which is like, what are the benefits of a rights-based approach to AI as, a, as opposed to some of the other approaches? And then fourth and finally, how do we ensure that the human rights opportunities posed by AI outweigh the risks that they might present? Okay, so I'm going to give you this is a short version of the talk uh, for those who need to log off uh, early. Four takeaways. Um, I'm kind of stunned by the range of human rights that AI is impacting and the paradoxical nature of those impacts. Some impacts are positive, some are negative, and you know, sometimes it's positive or negative for different people. So that's quite interesting. Uh, but I'm an optimist. And I think there's enormous potential to use AI technology to improve rights outcomes, right? To protect rights and to help people better enjoy their rights. Now, um, in order to do that, that requires people in the private sector to step up and take their human rights responsibilities seriously. More on that in a moment. Uh, but at the end of the day, we also need governments to regulate the sector. So that's sort of the argumentative structure. Okay. <clears throat> 
what are human rights? Um, what I will do is after this section of the talk, I might pause and just see if there's any questions on just this stuff, um, because I think it will be key to understanding what follows. OK, so what are human rights? Um, this is a term that's really hard to define. Um, there is a concept in social science known as the essentially contested concept uh, proposed by a philosopher named Walter Galley. And that's the idea that, you know, there are certain kinds of uh, concepts that you just can't precisely define because there's so much contestation of what the definition is. When you think of others, we can think of, you know, morality as an essentially uh, contested concept or truth. Um, but human rights are one of them. So there's lots of different ways that we can think of human rights. I'm a lawyer and to my legal hammer, every problem looks like a nail. So I'm going to take a, a, a legal approach to the question, but it's important to um, realize that there's lots of different forerunners to the concept of human rights um, in religion, right? The idea that human beings are born and endowed with rights by their creator from moral philosophy, and interesting note, just given what's happening in the world today, is that a lot of the conceptualization of human rights that happened in the early 20th century happened in Lviv uh, in Ukraine, uh, which, you know, the turn of the 20th century was a great center of learning um, and especially of, of thinking about law and rights. So I just raise that given what's happening in the world today that um, you know, human rights certainly have some, a lot to do with what's happening in Ukraine, but we'd say that much of the fountainhead of this of these concepts I'm going to talk about is over there. OK, human rights as law. So this is a pretty new body of law. I've talked about what happened in the early 20th century in Viviv. So the first time we had an articulation of human rights in a legal way was in 1948. So this is Eleanor Roosevelt, the widow of the American President Franklin Delano Roosevelt, holding the United Nations Universal Declaration of Human Rights, right, which was passed in 1948. The first statement by the international community of what kinds of rights all people around the world are entitled to just by virtue of being human. And of course, this happened after the Second World War. Not surprising, uh, given the horrors of that war the dehumanization that happened, genocide, all of these awful things that, you know, it was um, quite, we understand why that um, that was a moment where it was felt very necessary to say, these are our core commitments that every one of us enjoys. Okay, so we're going to talk about the substance of what these rights are, but it's important to understand that human rights exist at three different levels. So, at the international level, we have treaties, agreements between governments, right, that recognize the rights of all people and impose certain kinds of duties on governments. In each country around the world, we also have constitutions and laws enacted by parliaments and legislators that intend to protect human rights and remedy um, adverse treatment from the past. And in between that, we have some regional systems of law. Um, Europe is a great example. So the European Union is a regional body and the European Union has uh, its own human rights commitments that look similar to what we find at the international level, except because of how Europe works, they're a bit more binding where you have better mechanisms. There's a court in Strasbourg um, that can adjudicate human rights claims amongst all European nations in a way that's harder at the international level. OK. People like me tend to divide these rights into two broad categories. The first are civil and political rights. When you ask most people about human rights, this is what they think about. You know, the right to life, the right to free expression, the right to privacy, to fair criminal procedures, it's like the presumption of innocence, for example, in a criminal trial, the right to vote. Um, the right to peacefully protest, the right to equality and non-discrimination, right? These are the core things. You often find them in 
um, domestic constitutions, um, starting with the American constitution and going on many other countries, right? What's perhaps more surprising to, uh, frankly, many lawyers and um, many non-lawyers as well, is that human rights are much broader than this. There's also a concept of economic, social, and cultural rights. For example, the right to work, the right to health, the right to a reasonable standard of living, or to benefit from scientific progress. Okay, so we have two broad categories of rights. Now, some people will say these are, uh, this first category, these are negative rights. Um, you enjoy the right from governments not interfering with them. So take, you know, free expression, right? Uh, the freedom to say, say stuff. Um, some would argue that, oh, well, you enjoy that freedom when there's no law that says you can't say X. Whereas these rights, you know, the right to help. How do you give someone a right to help? Well, it usually means that a government or someone else has to build a hospital and provide you with access to services that cost money. So some people would say that these are positive rights, that they require action by someone to enjoy them. Um, I'd say this is a bit of a false dichotomy. Um, take privacy. Um, you know, yes, the government can come and violate your privacy, um, but without any law that governs how our personal information is shared, um, you're, you can be sure that there's going to be all kinds of privacy violations. Right, so you actually need governments to do something to protect these rights and to make, and, and ensure that they're enjoyed um, as much as with these economic, social, and cultural rights. I'm going to pause here just to make sure that I have everyone along with me and see if there's any questions about what we have so far on the table. Okay. Uh, yes. Yeah. Um so these human rights are sometimes um, you say that there are international level and regional and country level and uh, you said any uh, one precedes over the other that's one question and if so uh, and uh, and second thing is uh, if it is uh, like also sometimes it's subjective uh, for some nations it looks like a human right violation uh, they use that as a pretext to do a lot of things uh, and for some other nation, it is not. So, uh, yeah, I'm just curious about your view. Yeah, so that great questions. Um, on your first question, is there a hierarchy? Not really, um, except it gets a little complicated. So I'm going to come back to that question about three slides because I'll start to address it there. We'll, we'll unpack a little bit more. Okay. Um, second, um, how subjective are these? Well, this is where things get really hard between people who are lawyers and people who are technical. Technical people like objectivity, standards, right? Uh, a score, so you know, for example, you, you will state something in terms of a confidence interval to say, how confident are we that this thing works? With statistical precision. Law doesn't work that way, right? Um, law is a social concept and people's ideas of what it means differ and the same words can change meaning over time right so there is a lot of debate about what these things mean specifically right and it's actually that debate and disagreement that leads to the development of the law um so that's i hope that's a useful answer that's responsive to the question um I would argue, however, that there is certainly a lot of weaponization of these concepts uh, by people who don't really honor the idea of what they mean uh, to justify things that are unjustifiable. Yeah. Okay, so to move on, something important to understand about rights is that they are not unlimited, right? Almost every right can be limited by government. Um, in pursuit of some other objectives, right? So reasonable limitation is the idea. So let me give you an, uh, the classic example. We all have a right to privacy. And the right to privacy basically means that, you know, the police shouldn't come barging into your house um, um, or, you know, reading your, looking at your, searching your computer or whatever else, right? That's the background rule. But what if you're suspected, suspected of a crime? 
Uh, what then? Well, um, we have procedures, right, that authorize the police to interfere with your right to privacy in certain circumstances. In a rule of law society, the police can't just barge into anyone's house at any time to search for anything, right? They need to investigate and develop the grounds of suspicion so that they go to usually a judge or a magistrate and say, you know, I think this person, I have, I have a lot to suggest that this person's engaged in criminal behavior. I want to search them. And in which case, you know, uh, the police will be authorized to search. That's an example of a limitation, right? So you enjoy privacy in general, but there are times where we will limit that right. Okay, so to go to, um, to respond to the first part of the question that was just asked, um, international law and those international treaties are agreements between governments, right? And when a government signs up for an international treaty or a regional treaty, they make a commitment to the community of nations that they will protect those rights. Okay, so what does that mean? It means that the government itself will not violate human rights. So in my example that I just gave you of the, you know, privacy, right, the police will follow the rules uh, in searching people and not just search people randomly or wantonly. Okay, so that's the first part. But the second part is really interesting, right? Which is that we can each violate each other's rights. I can invade your privacy too, right? So in order to protect those rights, we need the government to do something to make sure that all of us behave appropriately. Right, enacting laws, um, um, enacting other kinds of measures, right? So a law that says, hey, don't break into someone's house, or a law that says, guess what? If you are poor, you get free health care, right? We need that. So we need, we need um, and then finally, we need mechanisms to enforce all of those rights. So sometimes that's a police force. Sometimes it takes funding to ensure that people have enjoy the right to education, like by adequately funding schools. Okay, so that's an international duty that states owe each other. So they say it's an agreement between them, saying that we're gonna do this. What happens when they violate those agreements? Well, international law is not as enforceable as domestic law is, right? So if your rights are violated by your own government and you live in a place with some rule of law, you can go to court. It's a bit harder at the international level, but this doesn't mean that um, the law doesn't exist. And let me give you a contemporary example, right? The invasion of Ukraine. Um, there's a, you know, international law says you can't invade countries. You can't do that. You can't just aggressively go in and conquer someone else's territory. Russia has broken the law. Is there an international police force that can go in and stop Putin? No. Does it matter that there's international law that governs this? Yes. Other countries feel empowered to take various kinds of actions, right? To condemn what has happened and to, um, you know, for example, the sanctions, right? Um, to try to punish and deter uh, Putin's government. Same thing is basically true of, by, of, of how this gets enforced internationally, right? Which is when a government like China and the Uyghurs is systematically violating rights, there's no international police force that goes into China to stop that, but we take other measures and it matters. Okay, so that's what governments do, right? But here's the, here's the interesting twist. There was now growing recognition that companies, businesses have a responsibility to respect human rights. What does that mean? It means that when you're doing business, you're making a product, you're selling it, you're, you know, whatever kind of, it, whatever it is, right? From, um, you know, food service to mining, to telecommunications, to AI, to social networking, any kind of business, right? Being a responsible business means that you shouldn't violate people's rights when you are doing business with your product and services, right? 
And if you're connected to someone, if you're doing business with someone else who's doing bad stuff, well, you should try to stop that too, right? So you're selling your technology to another company that's using it to build, let's say, some kind of espionage platform. Well, you shouldn't do that either. You should try to get stop the other person from doing that. And then if harms occur, well, you've got to make it right. You've got to remedy those harms and make people whole. Okay, that's the heavy going part of the of the talk. Um, any questions here about what these are? Okay, seeing none, I got to proceed to the next part, which asks the question of, well, what are the human rights impacts of AI? Um, well, that's a really hard question, uh, not only because of, you know, conceptual uh, difficulties in defining AI, but the fact that, you know, let's just stick with machine learning as sort of a, you know, a core approach. Um, the applications are infinite. Right? Um, the impact is going to depend on who's using it and how it's being used for what goal, right? It's very hard to say generally. So, uh, a couple of years ago, I co authored this report that tried to answer this question. So, we took a bunch of case studies and let me unpack this diagram for a moment. On the left, we took six kind of examples of, of applications where AI is being used. On the right side, we took a whole bunch of human rights that are in that universal declaration that I showed you, Eleanor Roosevelt holding it. And then we drew some lines connecting the different applications, the different rights, and we use a color code, right? Blue means generally positive, yellow uh, means indeterminate, uh, and red means negative. And you can see a lot of, it's not the best resolution, I'm sure, of her uh, screen share. Um, but uh, I can share the link to this. And if you look at it, there's a lot, a lot of different colors. Okay, so what does this mean? And how do we interpret this? How do we determine what the human rights impacts of AI are? And why does that matter? So let me give you a case that actually doesn't involve AI, uh, drawn from criminal justice. And this has to do with risk assessment algorithms. Uh, Compass is a famous one used in the United States to classify um, how likely it is that someone, um, you know, who has been sort of charged with a crime is uh, to reoffend, right? Or, or once they've been convicted, how likely are they to reoffend? Um, and the purpose of that is to say, you know, how long should they be in jail for? Okay, so Compass does not use machine learning. Um, it is an actuarial algorithm, right? So a bunch of people have come up with survey instrument um, and you know done the work to say, okay, you know what's predictive of a risk of reoffense. But you could imagine machine learning being used to do this. And in fact, there are some ML-based products in this space. Um, but we'll stick with this one. Okay. So first of all. There's a lot of bias in criminal justice in the United States. So here's some graphs that show uh, the US prison population uh, at different years, right? Um, for different ethnic groups and genders. So if you look at the at the lighter color of green, that was the incarceration rate for every 100,000 uh, residents in 1960. The darker green bar is the incarceration rate in 2010. And you can see that black people are, you know, um, much more likely to be imprisoned than uh, whites or Hispanics. And in 1960, the multiple, if you do the math, there were five times as many black people in jail as white people per capita. In 2010, it's 6.4 times. Remarkable. It's gotten worse, right? Okay. So into this, we introduce this risk assessment system. Right, where there's an actuarial model um, that they validate through, you know, um, actuarial techniques, and then basically, uh, when someone is arrested or convicted, um, you know, they go through the questionnaire, the inventory, and then the uh, manual algorithm, hand crank algorithm, uh, comes up with a score. Right? Are they high risk or low risk? And it's a seven point score. Okay. So. In 2016, an investigative journalism organization called ProPublica in the United States 
did this big story saying that this system is super biased. And what they did, this is sort of the core finding, this slide. OK, so if we take um, the top line here of this table, this is the percentage of people that the system um, labeled as high risk, but didn't reoffend. OK, so if you are white and labeled high risk, only 23.5% of those people did not be affected. That means that three quarters of the people that were identified as white, as high risk, who were white, didn't be affected. Okay. If you were black, right, labeled high risk but didn't be affected, 44%. So that means that only one in two black people who were labeled high risk be affected. Okay. And then we see sort of the opposite phenomenon happening with labeled low risk, yet they did reoffend, right? 50% of low risk white people reoffended, right? Um, only 25% of low risk black people reoffended. So the suggestion here is that this is skewed racially, right? That the system is much too severe when it comes to um, assigning risk scores to black people and much too lenient when it comes to white people. Okay. And this is a race blind algorithm, right? Um, the system works um, with 137 questions. The inventory race is not one of them. Of course, all of you know that there are many correlates for race, and I'm sure that there are many correlates in their questions. OK, so um, certainly racial bias appears to be a problem here. But I'm going to suggest to you that a human rights approach leads to a fuller picture of the kinds of issues that this sort of system poses. OK, so what does this little diagram show? Remember my spaghetti graph here? Um, there's a, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights has 30 enumerated rights in it. So this one shows the rights that we think are affected by something like Compass. And let's assume for a moment that it is ML, right? Um, so. If you look here uh, at the top right of the slide, uh, freedom from discrimination and equality before the law. Well, what I just showed you seems to suggest that the system is um, creating, is, is discriminating on the basis of race because it systematically treats um, black people more severely than white people, right? But there's other rights that are impacted by this kind of system. So, what are those? So there's a lot of different kinds of rights. So for example, you have a right against arbitrary arrest, right? If someone's going, if the government's going to arrest you or detain you, they have to have a good reason to do so. Um, is it true that this inventory of risk um, that has been you know, put together um, um, meets that standard? Hard to say. Maybe yes, maybe no, right? That's why it's yellow. Um, what about your right to life and liberty? Well, you know, we generally don't like to jail people. You only want to jail them in um, circumstances where it's really needed. Uh, here too, it's hard to say. It's possible that one of these systems um, is better than humans at predicting risk, so there's less people being jailed for no good reason. On the other hand, it could make mistakes. But there are some things that we certainly view as risky, right? One of them is that privacy. Obviously, this is a, like all machine learning systems that use data about people, personal data. There's a um, interference with the right to privacy right? because the systems are being fed your personal data. Um, and then there's other questions, right? You have a right to be presumed innocent in criminal proceed in criminal proceedings, uh, and the right to a fair public trial. Um, and, you know, this is like where the black box problem uh, comes in. So, of course, Compass is not ML. It's, we can easily audit it because of the way it's constructed. Um, but there's really interesting questions about how do you, um, you know, how do you have that fair, uh, a fair public hearing if some kind of proprietary system is making the call about how risky a person you are? Okay, so what I'm trying to show you here is that 
there's a whole range of human rights impacts from these systems. Things that, you know, if we're looking at the fairness, accountability, transparency lens or the ethical lens, sure, we're going we're gonna to identify some of these things, right, and discuss them. Uh, but there's two things here, right, which is that we're identifying more issues through the human rights lens. And as I'll show you in a moment, human rights law has some solutions to these problems. OK, so that's how we get this diagram, right? So in our report, we looked at risk scores and criminal justice. We looked at credit scoring in the financial system, healthcare diagnostics, automated grading and education, content moderation, um, and of course, you know, um, the use of algorithmic systems in hiring. There are many, many, many others. We just took those six cases to get um, the conversation started. Let me pause there and see if there's any questions. Okay, seeing none, I will move forward to the third section of the talk, which is, well, so what are the benefits of this approach? Um, I started by telling you that you're going to pick up some other kinds of things um, that are um, with a human rights lens that are sort of uh, fact lens or ethical lens won't pick up, but there's there's more to it, right? So this is actually kind of responsive to the question that was asked earlier in the talk. So there's obviously disagreement about what exactly human rights mean, but they are universal. And I would argue that there's a lot more agreement about what human rights mean than there is about concepts like eth ethics, fairness, accountability, right? So human rights are law. And we have processes in the law to clarify the meaning of terms. People might disagree with something, but then you have a process. You have court cases, you have decisions, right? Ethics are much murkier. They're much more situational. You know, consider the question of what's fair. Lots of philosophers can disagree about fairness, right? Um, same thing about ethics. You know, is it ethical to uh, for a person to who's hungry to steal bread? Or, you know, uh, questions, there's some interesting survey research about the ethics of adultery, right? And how different people have different views on that. Um, so it's a much slipperier concept. So the fact that human rights are universal and that they, there's relatively more agreement about what they mean can help with these conversations to answer for us. So yeah, so this is the point around shared language. So those of us who work in this field, regardless of where we are in the world, speak this language, right? Um, the analysis that I showed you would, could be done by someone with human rights training in India or the Philippines or Australia or Zimbabwe, right? Um, and again, those human rights treaties apply to all those governments and that responsibility for respect human rights applies to companies regardless of where they are in the world, which brings me to the third thing. Uh, their law, you must comply, right? Um, people can be ethical or not. The, uh, and of course, the law codifies a lot of ethics, to be sure, a lot of morality and conceptions of fairness. Um, but, you know, the law sets the floor. So you must comply with these, is a pretty good uh, reason, right? But it's not an either or. We do need both kinds of approaches. My call is to just say that we should also bring human rights in here. Okay, so fourth and final bit of the talk. Um, keep this pretty quick. So for you, who are mostly a technical audience, thinking about um, these concepts as you're developing technologies, well, what do you do? How do you make this work? So two things. Um, I'd say that a lot of people um, who are in the sort of legal and public policy field have been like much too critical of AI. Um, so yes, there are a lot of problems with bias, discrimination, fairness, you name it, right? But there's also a lot of problems with human decision makers. And one of the great things that is happening with the automation of decision making is that we're learning more about how bad human decision making is, right? We're collecting the data for machine learning and analyzing it, saying, wow, we have some problematic patterns, in here, right? So that, I think, is an opportunity, right? Of, we could transcend human biases, human limitations. We could change history. We can change existing ways of doing things and make them better, right? 
So here's like a little example that I love. So, you know, there's a lot of talk about how the use of, um, you know, um, machine learning powered systems in, in sort of the high employment field, right, uh, leads to social reproduction, right? The system recommends people who are, uh, look like previous hires and in tech that might be a largely male workforce, right, overlooking women systematically. Um, you know, but there are tools that try to overcome this. So Entero is a, you know, HR startup um, in, this in, in this field. And, you know, they have this um, interesting use of ML to try to anonymize uh, job candidate profiles. So you can't tell their gender. You can't tell what school they went to, right, to try to make the evaluation system more um, objective. So that's great, right? Now, the question is, how do we sort of harness this power? Right. So if, if there's a positive case here for AI and human rights, um, how do we actually do it? So the first thing is goes back to this idea of the responsibility of companies to respect human rights. So this is an idea developed by John Ruggie, uh, who uh, passed away last year as a professor at Harvard, uh, worked with the United Nations to come up with these guiding principles on business and human rights. So you'll remember I told you before that governments have a duty to protect rights from being violated by government actors, by private actors. Well, he also, he developed this idea that companies should respect them, right? Do no harm. Don't be involved in abusing rights. Do business in a way that respects rights. So oops, the key concept here is due diligence, right? How do you avoid violating rights? Um, it's how you avoid doing any bad thing in your life by having your eyes open, right? By um, doing some due diligence to consider what are the impacts of what I'm about to do or what I'm about to sell to someone. So um, I believe that it, in previous talks, you've had some, some discussions about, you know, algorithmic impact assessments, um, algorithmic auditing, as well as the idea of an impact assessment before you commercialize a product to see how well it's performing. Um, same thing with ongoing auditing and accountability to detect um, proper functioning. So in, in these um, impact assessment audit processes, right, considering them not just from a fairness perspective, but considering those rights, just like I showed you with those diagrams, right, asking those questions comprehensively. Is there an impact here on the right to education or to a fair trial or whatever else, right? So doing that work um, is important. And doing that can, you know, identify problems before they arise, and ensure um, that technologies are deployed in a responsible way. And this is something I must say that Nokia is doing. So Nokia has a corporate human rights policy uh, that has a very strong commitment to human rights due diligence, which I saw uh, with my own eyes when I did some legal work uh, for the company a couple of years ago. Um, and there's industry-wide. Um, work on this to organizations like Partnership on AI that are trying to develop guidance on how to think about algorithmic accountability and health assessment, et cetera. So all that is great, but um, what we also know is that these kinds of measures that companies do by themselves, that they sort of take on um, by themselves as sort of uh, responsible business practices, they work to a certain level. Right. Beyond that, we actually do need governments to come in. This is a picture of a great book by Rick Locke, who's a political scientist at Brown University, who looked at how, like, how much did sort of corporate voluntary behavior change work in supply chains, where there's a, you know, like, um, shoe and apparel factory with a lot of human rights problems. And he found that, you know, they work as well as government support them, actually. You kind of need a government that supports it. So, you know, I think it's important for companies to take their responsibilities very seriously and to implement them. But ultimately, we're also going to need governments to legislate. So the governments have that duty to protect human rights, so they need to set some rules for the road on how, um, how and when algorithmic systems are allowed to be used and what kinds of impacts um, we think are appropriate and which ones that we would uh, uh, ban as well. Okay, I will leave it there. Thank you very much. I'm very curious to hear your questions.